So the next kind of interaction network we'll talk about are genetic interactions. And so a genetic interaction between a pair of genes is defined to occur when uh, the phenotype you get when you, for example, mutate both genes is unexpected based on the phenotypes you see uh, if you mut mutate either gene individually. And so uh, one of the most common kinds of genetic interactions is called uh, synthetic lethality, where if you have, say, for example, in the normal functioning cells with both genes uh, functional, the cell is fine and viable. If you knock out either gene individually, uh, the cell is still viable. But if you knock out both genes, then uh, that would be a lethal mutation leading to cell death. And so that's an example of synthetic lethality. Uh, one of the most famous examples of synthetic lethality and its practical applications uh, is basically the story of BRCA1. And so the idea here is, is basically that there exists a gene called PARP1, which is basically a sensor of DNA damage. And it, uh, PARP1 really helps dictate which DNA repair pathway activates uh, when you have DNA damage. And so when you downregulate or say, for example, inhibit PARP1, uh, basically you get an accumulation of single and then double-stranded DNA breaks. And when that happens, you basically, the cell basically relies on the BRCA1 gene. It's part of the homologous recombination mediated repair pathway uh, to repair the double-stranded breaks. And so one of the key findings in cancer therapy was really that um, BRCA1 mutant cancers, so those are cancer cells that uh, have BRCA1 mutations that inactivate BRCA1. Uh, those are those BRCA1 mutant cancer cells are unable to repair the double-stranded breaks. And so basically, if you happen to, for example, inhibit PARP1 with uh, some kind of PARP1 inhibitor, and you have a cancer cell with a BRCA1 mutant, then those cancer cells will, for example, die because they have no way of repairing the many uh, double-stranded DNA breaks that start to accumulate. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have normal cells in the same patient uh, with functional BRCA1 genes, then they can actually survive, the normal cells can actually survive PARP1 inhibition because they still have BRCA1 to repair the DNA damage. Um, and so in this specific case, BRCA1 and PARP1 um, are said to exhibit like a synthetic lethal interaction because inactivation of both basically leads to cell death, but inactivation of either one on their own is not lethal anyways. And so I mentioned that a genetic interaction is defined as um, what you get when you, when the phenotype of a double mutant is unexpected given the phenotypes of the individual mutants. And so an important question then becomes, well, how do you define an unexpected phenotype? And so there's two basic models that people consider when they think about how to compute what the expected phenotype of a double mutant is based on the uh, single mutant phenotypes. The first model is called an additive model of genetic interactions. So the idea here is that suppose that you're measuring cell viability as a phenotype and your wild type cells have a viability of 1.0. If your uh, mutation of gene A leads to a phenotype of 0 0.7, so it had an effect of negative 0.3. And on the other hand, if your mutation of gene B led to a phenotype of 0 0.5, and so its uh, additive effect was negative 0 0.5, then the predicted phenotype of your double mutant would just be the sum of those two effects. So it'd be minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.3. Uh, and that would give you a expected double mutant phenotype of 0.2. On the other hand, on the in the multiplicative model of genetic interactions, uh, the idea here is that if your final phenotype of mutant A versus B is 0 0.7 to 0 0.5, that means that your multiplication, the multiplicative effect of knocking out gene A, for example, was 0.7, multiplicative effect of knocking out gene B was 0.5, and so your expected phenotype of your double mutant um, would be 0.7 times 0.5 times 1, which would give you 0.35. And so you can see that these additive and multiplicative models don't always agree with each other. And so another question would then be, well, how do you decide which model to pick? And that kind of depends on what phenotype you're looking at. Um, for some phenotypes, the additive model, for example, doesn't really make sense. So for example, if you go back to the phenotype of cell viability, if 1.0 means you know, fully viable cell and 0. 0 means a dead cell. Uh, just think about what would happen if you 
had two mutations whose individual effects were negative 0.9. So they mostly uh, killed off the cell, but not completely. Then your expected phenotype of your double mutant would be negative 0.8. And so if one is alive and zero is fully dead, then what is a what is the expected phenotype of negative 0.8 really mean then? Um, so it's worth also mentioning a few terms. So a negative genetic interaction generally refers to um, combinations of uh, mutations that lead to a phenotype that's more extreme than you expected by chance or based on your, um, your model. And a positive genetic interaction would be a combination of uh, mutations that leads to some phenotype that's less extreme than you would expect. So over the next few slides, I'll discuss a few of the different common kinds of genetic interactions you can observe. First of which is called a negative synthetic lethal interaction. The idea here is that there are, no, there are a large number of essential pathways that are essential to cell viability, um, but they contain, for example, redundant pathways that make the cell more robust to mutation. And so in the example I give you here, suppose we have an essential pathway where there's actually two kind of backup uh, genes that perform redundant function. And so the idea is that if you knock out either one of those uh, genes that are backups of each other, that only knocks out one out of two possible pathways in this in this illustration. But the cell is still viable with only one knockout because there's two genes that are backups of each other. But the idea is that if you knock out both at the same time, then the entire pathway is shut down, which leads to lethality. And so one example of synthetic uh, lethal interactions is the BRCA1 and PARP1 uh, example I gave a few slides ago. And so here the idea is that, again, in the figure above, uh, you can see that in terms of the fitness of the cell, where fitness, for example, here could just mean like colony size, uh, individual knockouts would lead to a, a decrease in fitness to, say, for example, 0 0.7 or 0 0.5, so both uh, individual knockouts are, are not lethal. And so based on, for example, a, mul a multiplicative model, you would expect that the double knockout, uh, if they're, you know, if these genes are independent, would lead to a fitness of 0 0.35. But if you actually observe, say, zero, uh, because those two genes uh, have a negative synthetic lethal interaction, then, you know, that then, they, then they're interacting. And so Again, the main point here is that when your, uh, when the fitness of your combined double knockout is significantly lower than what you'd expect based on, for example, a multiplicative model, then that's when you have a negative synthetic lethal interaction, specifically when your double knockout has a fitness of zero. And so another example of a, in this case, a positive suppressive genetic interaction happens when, so a genetic uh, suppression event is generally a positive genetic interaction that occurs when uh, you have a mutant in one gene that leads to some loss in phenotype uh, that's typically, say, severe. Like in this case, mutation of the B gene leads to a fitness of 0.5. Uh, but if you mutate a second gene, uh, that second gene's mutation in some sense suppresses the effect of the first one and actually raises your fitness level. So in this case, suppression of the gene A in addition to B leads to a slight increase in fitness compared to what you'd expect based on the individual mutations themselves. Um, and so these kind of genetic suppression events uh, that occur when you have two, in this case, loss of function mutations or deletions uh, are generally useful for, for example, identifying negative regulators of certain components of a pathway. So for example, uh, GCD1 is a negative regulator of amino acid biosynthesis. Uh, and it basically represses this pathway when you have starvation in the cell. Uh, and it primarily acts by down-regulating the gene GCN4. And so the idea here is that if you, uh, delete, G if you delete GCD1, uh, then what that means is that you lose repression of the GCN4 gene. And so what that means is that GCN4 can basically constitutively uh, activate amino acid biosynthesis even when you have starvation. And so that's why you see this big loss to fitness of 0.5. Um, but if you actually delete GCN4 
in addition to deleting GCD1, then you actually, in some sense, bring your fitness back up to 0.7 where you see suppression of the effect of the uh, GCD1 mutation. Because now that you've also deleted GCN4, you actually also prevent amino acid biosynthesis uh, via GCN4 during starvation. Uh, your fitness doesn't go all the way back up to one though, because obviously deleting uh, GCN4 or any other transcriptional activator of a pathway is still going to have some kind of deleterious effect. Uh, but you do rescue the phenotype of uh, deleting just GCD1. An interaction is known as a co-equal interaction. And so co-equal interactions tend to happen between uh, proteins that uh, basically belong to the same non-essential protein complex uh, or a linear pathway in the genome. Right, so the the idea here is that uh, if you need all of the if you need all of these genes present in order to have a functional complex, then deleting any one of the members of that complex basically should lead to a decrease in fitness. But once you delete one of them, then it doesn't matter how many more of them you delete because either way the protein complex is completely non-functional. Um, and deletion of any member of that complex should have about the same fitness because um, once you delete one component again, you have a non-functional complex and so it can't perform whatever function it's supposed to. Some terms of experimentally generating genetic interaction maps, there's basically three components. Uh, first, you need a procedure for generating single mutant libraries. Second, you need a, some kind of technology or assay to combine single mutants into double mutants. And then you finally need some kind of um, way of measuring a phenotype in a high throughput way uh, that doesn't require you to inspect each individual double mutant uh, separately. So to generate a single mutant library, your strategy basically depends on whether or not you're trying to knock out a essential or non-essential gene. And so if you're just dealing with a non-essential gene, uh, there's some pretty blunt tools that you can use in addition to the tools that you can use for non-essential genes as well. Uh, in terms of blunt tools, you can literally just take your ORF of interest or protein coding gene of interest, and you can replace it with a drug resistant marker that you can use to select for deletions. Uh, where you basically add in like a drug resistant marker like CanMX uh, and you add some tags or barcodes that allow you to then identify which gene you mutated uh, later on. Um, these are fairly blunt mutations in the sense that you're completely deleting the gene. If you want to do something more subtle like change, test the effect of uh, changing the expression level of a gene, then you can use uh, strategies B through D. And so if you're using, if you are uh, trying to delete a, an essential gene or knock out essential gene, uh, you have to use one of the strategies from B to D. So strategy B basically uh, involves generating temperature sensitive alleles. And so the idea is that here for an essential gene, what you can do is you can introduce a point mutation into your coding sequence that effectively doesn't uh, inactivate your protein, but it does alter its stability. And so, for example, at higher temperatures, uh, the protein structure may unfold, for example, and therefore reduce its uh, ability to function. Um, the second thing you can do is uh, introduce a conditional allele where basically what you do is you take the original gene and you put it under the control of a tetracycline regulated promoter, uh, which basically means uh, in the presence of tetracycline or one of its analogs like doxycycline, uh, it, it'll basically shut off expression of that gene. And so uh, in addition to that, you also need the drug selection marker like CanMX to make sure that you can select for um, properly transformed cells. And last thing you can do is uh, basically make a mutation in the, for example, three prime end uh, of the original coding gene. So you can insert your drug selection marker at the three prime end of the gene. And what that can do is basically destabilize your mRNA transcripts uh, so that the gene is still being expressed, but the, for example, like the half-life of the mRNA might be much lower than it usually is. And so once you generate your um, library of single mutants, then what you need is a technology for generating double mutants from those single mutants in a kind of high throughput way. 
And so in this lecture, we'll talk about three basic ways you can do that. Uh, one is called uh, SGA or synthetic genetic array. Uh, one's called DSLAM or diploid synthetic lethal analysis by microarray. And the third is called uh, what we'll call as GIM, uh, which is the genetic interaction mapping approach. Um, and so here on this slide, uh, I'm illustrating how they're used uh, when you're using yeast as the host cell. And so to, to understand this slide, you have to remember that yeast is a single cell eukaryote, um, but it can actually be found in either a haploid or diploid state. Uh, it's also important to know that mating between uh, two different yeast cells only happens when they're in the haploid state. And it has to be between haploids that are of different mating types. And so you're, uh, the mating type of any particular yeast cell can either be in the A or alpha state. Um, and an interesting fact of yeast is that uh, a haploid a yeast in a cell in a haploid state can actually switch its mating type um, as often as actually at like every cell cycle. Uh, and this happens through genetic recombination at the mat locus. And so in the SGA approach to generating double means, uh, basically the idea is that you start out with, you conceptually start out with a uh, mat alpha mutant strain and that mat alpha mutant strain is carrying some kind of query mutation along with a drug resistance marker. And so the query mutation can essentially be one of the four approaches that I talked about in the last slide. And that's uh, basically that query mutation is represented by the black filled circle. And so the idea is that you're basically trying to cross this mat alpha uh, query mutation strain against an entire array of about, say like genome wide in yeast, that would be like 4,800 uh, or so mat A uh, deletion mutants or conditional alleles of, of like your essential genes. Um, and so the idea is that both your uh, array mut mutant strains as well as your query strains, again, they have these, uh, they're marked with these drug resistance uh, selection markers like CANMX4 uh, or NATMX4 um, so that you can select for uh, successful transformations. Um, so after you mate your query against your uh, MAT-A strains, uh, you need to then select for diploids so that you make sure you get double heterozygous diploids. Uh, you then make these cells undergo sporula sporulation, which means that uh, you have these, you start out with these heterozygous diploids and you end up generating haploid cells from those diploid cells. And then after that, you can then do essentially double selection to make sure that you have uh, double mutants because if the query and the uh, MAT-A strings have different drug selection markers, by selecting for using both uh, drugs, you can basically identify the double mutants. And then at the end of the day, your SGA screen basically produces an array of uh, an array of double mutants where you know in each spot which double mutants were supposed to be generated in that spot. And so then you can use like imaging or basically high throughput imaging to look at uh, these arrays and then score them for fitness, for example. So you can look at like their measurements of their colony size to assess you know, what the impact of a double mutation was uh, on colony size relative to control. Um, and But there's also other phenotypes you can look at, like morphology or things like this. In terms of the DSLAM and genetic interaction mapping methods, um, those, those two methods actually are pretty similar uh, for most of the protocols. Uh, they just differ at the very beginning in how they generate uh, pools of double heterozygous diploid mutants. And so again, the, the main difference between SGA versus DSLAM and genetic interaction mapping is that um, is whether or not you take like a pooled approach. And so the, in the SGA approach, you're generating these arrays where in each spot, you kind of know exactly which double mutant there is. Uh, in the DSLAM and genetic interaction method, you're actually just generating pools of, of diploids and then pools of double mutants. Um, and then you're basically looking at like the relative number of double mutants you see and using that relative number as a measure of, of how much, uh, you know, how much relative fitness each double mutant has relative to everybody else. Um, and so the, the DSLAM and genetic interaction methods are similar to um, like the CRISPR screen that I talked about um, in the gene ontology uh, lecture where I said that uh, you can introduce, like you can generate pools of cells um, with different mutations and then use sequencing. You can Through sequencing, you can uh, measure the relative number of cells with each double mutation or with each single mutation in that case um, to basically assess fitness. And so the, the idea is the same here for DSLAM and genetic interaction mapping. Um, 
Um, and so in DSLAM, for example, you start out with the query mutation represented by the, the filled black circle, and that's linked to a year or three uh, selectable marker, and you just introduce uh, this query mutation into a pool of heterozygous diploid strains by some kind of high efficiency integrative transformation. Uh, in the genetic interaction mapping approach, uh, it's it's pretty similar to SG in the sense that you start out with a mat alpha uh, haploid query strain and it carries some kind of query mutation and drug resistance marker represented by the filled black circle. Um, and then you mate that mat alpha haploid query strain against a pool of uh, mat A deletion mutants. So again, genetic interaction mapping is kind of like SGA, it's instead of uh, the mating happening in individual race spots are just kind of doing it in a big pool. And so the idea again, uh, once you once you generate your uh, uh, your pool of double heterozygous diploids, then essentially the protocol uh, for both DSLAM and genetic interaction mapping looks just like SG, uh, except you're working in pools uh, instead of individual spots in an array. Um, at the end of the day, for DSLAM and genetic interaction mapping, you generate a pool of double mutants. And then again, you sequence the barcodes, um, which then allow you to measure the relative numbers of uh, double mutants, which then kind of gives you an idea of um, what the relative fitness level is. And so obviously, if you suppose in the nicest case, uh, your pool of double mutants um, has, or your, suppose your, um, your pool of double mutants has no representation uh, of a double mutant of gene A and B. Um, in theory, what that would tell you is that uh, a double mutation of both gene A and B uh, led to essentially lethality because you don't see any cell with a double mutation of gene A and gene B. Um, and so that's how you can kind of use the use the barcodes to assess the relative numbers of uh, cells containing each double mutant and then judge their relative fitness. And so similar to the protein-protein interaction network, um, doing genome-wide genetic interaction assays typically leads to giant hairballs, as shown in uh, part D of this diagram. Um, typically, so we'll talk a little bit later about how to do this, but typically what happens in genetic interaction uh, networks is that although you get, like, you know, although these visualizations produce huge numbers of, like, nodes and edges that can sometimes be hard to uh, decipher what's going on. Oftentimes what you'll actually find is that uh, groups of nodes tend to form what are called communities. And so again, we'll talk about this uh, in a few slides, but basically a community of nodes is a group of nodes that have a lot of interactions to other nodes within the group. And there's relatively few uh, edges going from nodes within the group to outside of the group. And so what these communities tend to represent are groups of uh, functionally related genes because they all kind of have genetic interactions with each other. And so they're all kind of, they all have some kind of functional relationship with each other. Um, and so it turns out that if you perform a uh, genetic interaction assay and you identify these communities, these communities tend to correspond to certain pathways, um, which you, you can then kind of identify um, using, uh, yeah, using network structure analysis approaches we'll talk about. Um, and through using technologies like, or through using um, strategies like gene set enrichment analysis, you can oftentimes look at communities and make educated guesses about what they do. And so genetic interaction mapping has a number of limitations, just like the protein-protein interaction assays. Um, in terms of phenotypes, so I mentioned, for example, for the SGA, um, uh, for the SGA approach, you generate these arrays of double mutants, and then you use like high throughput imaging to take a look and you know measure colony size or morphology or things like this. One of the biggest problems with uh, SGA is that um, it's generally speaking, people tend to use really easy to measure phenotypes like fitness because you can just look at the colony size. Um, even morphology is possible to look at in a relatively easy way. Um, but that's that's you know pretty much it, and so. Uh, if the, num you know, your interaction maps, uh, you know, whether or not a pair of genes is determined to have a genetic interaction depends on whether, um, you see an unexpected phenotype of the double mutant relative to the single mutants, but that kind of depends on whether you're, you know, whether you detect a, a true genetic interaction depends on whether you're looking at the right phenotype. And so for lots of genes, you may, 
they may have genetic interactions between them, but the, the proper phenotype that you need to look at in order to identify those genetic interactions may be something other than fitness. Um, and so, for example, people have shown that um, like 50% of the like yeast double mutant strains that are, have been generated have no uh, visible fitness defect, but they have, for example, shown abnormal like cell morphology. And so what that basically tells you is that you know, choosing the right phenotype to look at is key and high throughput approaches are usually only amenable to looking at easy to measure things like fitness or morphology. Um, it's, it's worth pointing out that there's a relatively small overlap between protein-protein interaction networks and genetic interaction networks. So for example, lots of people have studied PPI networks and genetic interaction networks in yeast. And oftentimes you can only find about like, you know, 10 to 20% of PPI pairs actually share some kind of genetic interaction. Um, and so yes, genetic interaction networks measure different things compared to protein-protein interaction networks. Um, but, you know, one might expect there should be more than more overlap than just 10 to 20%. Um, and the, you know, it's even worse if you look at the proportion of genetic interaction uh, that have supported PPI interactions in yeast anyways. Um, another potential problem is that, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of studying things like genetic interactions in yeast or protein-protein interactions in yeast is that um, it's typically easier to do that than, say, uh, doing genetic interaction assays in, like, humans and mouse. So oftentimes people uh, generate genetic interaction assays in yeast because they want to um, use orthology to then make educated guesses about genetic interactions of the homologous genes in, in humans or mouse or other organisms. But even between like related uh, yeasts, uh, related yeast species, oftentimes you only, you get like relatively little overlap uh, of genetic interactions mapping between the two uh, related yeast species. And so uh, it's not really clear how well you can use yeast, for example, as a model organism of genetic interactions um, upon which to base your idea about genetic interactions in other species.